religious minister. And uh, that's the way I kind of look at life. Now, having said that, let, let me also go on and prime the pump just a little bit. Uh, make sure that we are not too gentle with each other this evening. Uh, somewhere along the line, I came to the conviction that uh, every religious institution, uh, no matter what the persuasion, uh, should be asked to have at the entrance to its church, its synagogue, its mosque, its temple, its tabernacle, its meeting house, whatever, a very, very large sign, warning, participation may be dangerous to your health. Oh, uh, just to give you some idea of, of where I'm coming from, and where my sojourn has taken me, uh, because I think if truth, whatever it is, uh, has ever gotten a bad name, it's gotten it uh, in the name of the divine. So, uh, having set down the gauntlet, let's proceed. <clears throat> Perhaps it would be uh, helpful for me to uh, begin by giving you, uh, no, let's see, I did that, I don't know. Okay. Let's begin with a few words about tolerance. There we go. At first, at first blush, the, uh, the word suggests to me getting along with others. And getting along with others probably requires something like respect, as Pastor Martin has already mentioned, <coughs> kindness, consideration, things of that sort. The word might even carry with it the notion of empathy, perhaps the ability to use your imagination to walk in the other person's shoes. At any rate, if tolerance means any of these admirable qualities, What's all the fuss about? These qualities might serve us well when we examine viewpoints, including propositions about the nature of truth, which we may not understand or with which we may disagree. Truth takes many forms, and in much of the world, truth has at its disposal the force of arms. <coughs> whether we like it or not, the use of which can cause and do cause unimaginable horror. Politeness, respect, consideration, perhaps all of the above. The willingness to listen and to understand are qualities that no sane person would be willing to sacrifice in the name of truth or anything else. So what's all the fuss about? This is the real world that I live in, and I have a suspicion that many of you live there too. It is a world of ambiguity and contradiction. It is a world where misunderstanding is very persuasive, pervasive, in the name of truth, people are killed every day, and our environment corrupted by those who refuse to tolerate the needs of others. Probably at no point in history has this real world cried out for more tolerance and less emphasis on truth than today. So my hope is in this discussion which will surely center on the nature of religious truth. Religion in general, and perhaps Christianity in particular, what they have to offer us, that it does not degenerate into a scholastic exercise where we argue about how many angels can dance on the head of a pig. However, there is one problem with tolerance that has always concerned me. And that is that I suspect tolerance is a, uh, a quality, a behavior that has to be cultivated. You have to learn. 
We almost certainly are not born with it. My babies showed very little tolerance for my need for privacy and silence when <laughs> they were babies and when they were hungry. But in a few years, they got pretty good at it, with some very notable exceptions. <laughs> Unfortunately, the sad fact may be that some people are so deprived in their early years that tolerance in the form of respect for others, the ability to listen and show empathy, simply can never be cultivated. And it is quite possible that some people may be born lacking the genetic wherewithal, the ingredients that make tolerance possible. For instance, there may be a gene for empathy. Evolutionary theory would predict that, which probably is necessary for the display of tolerance. But what if you're born without it? If so, we may be destined the rest of our lives and always to live with some degree of intolerance, whether we like it or not. But a different way of looking at tolerance is that it may be under, uh, we may understand it as the ability to withstand discomfort. Some people clearly have a high degree of tolerance for pain, others very little. Some people seem to differ in the amount of tolerance they have for intellectual discontinuities, contradictions, or the lack of certitude. And some of that may be present here this evening. Some people are very discomforted by the lack of structure in their social lives. All of these things I see in my students, every term. Many years ago it became obvious to me that my students responded very differently to the ideas which I presented in class, which may have challenged their perceived ideas of prevailing wisdom, or might contradict with, with, with the ideas they brought to class. And although it hasn't happened often, occasionally a student has been so uncomfortable in class that he or she has had to leave. A, 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 simply a, the fight or flight uh, syndrome that, that I'm sure you've all experienced. But I decided in my early years of my teaching that I would refuse to remove all amb ambiguity. <coughs> Uh, discussions or assignments, and while I have always been willing to lead over backward to help my students, I refuse to structure my classes in a way that removes all intellectual and emotional threat. My pedagogical stance is firmly rooted in the notion, which I share with my students uh, every term, no pain, no gain. <laughs> In any case, this led me rather early on to the work of a psychologist at the University of Colorado by the name of O.J. Harvey back in the 60s and 70s. O.J. Harvey was very interested in the, the work of Rokic that started back in the 30s, which tried to grapple with the uh, very perplexing problem of fascism. How do you explain, in the land of Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms, and perhaps the greatest genius of all time, Goethe, the German people could embrace, and the Italian people could embrace, and the Spanish people could embrace this uh, awful, awful ideology. How do you explain that? Uh, Rokic died, unfortunately, after the Second World War, and, uh, and Hardy picked up on much of his work. There really wasn't much done with these kinds of questions back then. Uh, and he was especially interested in a, in, in, in a very helpful, in a very practical uh, notion, and that is, do teachers in a classroom tend to respond to high arousal stimuli which their students may, may confront them with in a flexible or a rigid fashion? Now, we all respond to high arousal stimuli on a continuum, a high arousal stimulus, by that Harvey meant 
Uh, you can imagine if somebody right now should yell fire in this room or in a crowded theater, that probably would raise somebody's blood pressure. It would probably do a little bit for mine. Uh, we are constantly bombarded by different kinds of stimuli, of varying degrees or of, of, uh, of, of threat, so to speak. In a typical classroom, uh, divergent ideas, challenging the teacher who's three feet above criticism, it can be quite a stimulating event. But unruly behavior in many of our public classrooms is also a, a high arousal stimulus for a great many teachers. And the question that Harvey was struggling with is, would teachers who tend to be more flexible respond more creatively and more helpfully to those students who don't agree or don't like what's going on in the classroom? Now, what he found out, as you can imagine, is that developed a test which we don't have time to discuss this evening, the teachers fall on a continuum of rigidity to flexibility. And that those teachers who fall in the flexible area of the continuum are teachers who exercise a little <laughs> more tolerance, but in the sense that their tolerance allows them the time to respond more creatively and problem solve in high arousal situations. <coughs> Rigid teachers, no matter how brilliant they may be and how much they know, may make excellent lecturers, but are very limited in terms of their ability to respond to high arousal stimuli. Get out of here. Go to the vice principal right now. Maybe the worst thing that could happen. Oh, you may also know and probably guess because I have a suspicion most of you are the products of our public school system when he found out, at least in the state of Colorado, that the majority of teachers fall very much in the area of the rigid end of the spectrum and school administrators even more so. I've often wondered if you could give this kind of a test to a large group of religious folks particularly pastors and theologians, how they would sort themselves out in terms of rigidity and flexibility. When I was in the meatpacking plant, I gave it to all of our plant supervisors. We had about 90 supervisors. And I gave this test to them to see where they would fall in terms of rigidity and flexibility.